So if you are uh, just joining us, we just started our summer in the Psalms last week uh, with Psalm 88, and today we are going to head into, I think, more for familiar territory, as I would say it. Uh, we're going to head to Psalm 23. So uh, if you have your Bible, you turn over to Psalm 23, or you can grab one of those scripture journals that we have in the seats, and you can turn over to page 36 and 38, uh, where Psalm 23 is going to be at. Um, and uh, there is there's a lot that um, I want to get into today, uh, but one of the things that I think um, one of the things that, that that is helpful before uh, bringing a word, um, especially one that seems fairly familiar to a lot of people, um, is to uh, ask God to maybe speak to us in a new way. Um, and and say something uh, to us today that maybe we've never heard before from these words, and uh, and so I just I want to take a second just to pause before we jump into like a sermon, and I just want to kind of read the word over you, and I want you to just listen to the words. I don't want you to like have your Bible open in front of you, even like I just want you to just sit um, in this as I read it over you. Um, and I, and I want you to just listen for, for maybe a word or a phrase uh, that stands out to you as I read this over um, that, that maybe you've never heard or, or realized or paid cl- too close attention to in, in the past. Uh, today, hopefully, it will, it will strike you and it will touch your heart. So I'm just going to invite you to sit up straight uh, so you don't fall asleep. All right, sit up straight. Close your eyes, put your hands maybe out in front of you with your palms open to the sky as just kind of a way of saying, hey, I'm open, God. I want you to just speak and I want you to say something uh, through your word to me that, that no preacher could say, right? And, uh, and I'm just gonna read this uh, slowly, okay? The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God, may you use this psalm in a way today that maybe we've never never heard it. May you speak it to us in a fresh way that maybe will change our lives and lead us closer in our relationship and walk with you, that we might trust you more deeply and give you our lives more fully. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So Psalm 23 is... Um, the most famous scripture in all of the Bible. 
It's the most read passage in all of Scripture, and um, and one that if you grew up in church, you probably know fairly well, or at least parts of it. Uh, I was I was uh, talking to Mallory about this last night, but but like uh, I'd, I'd give her the beginning of a phrase and she'd finish it right, uh, and and so like whether or not you know the exact order of it or how it all plays out in perfect unison, my guess is if I said surely goodness and you would be able to finish that right. Or if I said, you anoint my head with oil, and then you would say, my cup overflows. You, you could finish most of the lines if someone started the lines for you. Uh, if you grew up in church, my guess is, even if you don't know the order in which they fall in, um, it's just beautifully crafted. I mean, David just beautifully crafted this psalm in such an intricate and deep way. And, uh, and, I, and I've come to really love and embrace this psalm uh, because it means so much to me every single day. Like, it is not one of those psalms that, like, I hope I can pray or people will pray over me when I'm, uh, you know, in an urn or a casket and I've left this earth. It is, a, it is a psalm that I hope is true of me and my heart toward God uh, every single day. And my hope is, is that the same will be true for you uh, as we look at it today and as we gain a perspective of what it really is talking about. Um, and how it really calls us into deeper relationship with God. Um, I love the personal language that you find in Psalm 23. Maybe better than any other psalm in all of the psalms. Uh, This one is very personal. You see David using words like I and me uh, a lot instead of we and us. And so this is is personal to him uh, and it's personal to God. And so he declares this and and this is a glimpse into his heart and his relationship for God and toward God. and, and I love also the fact that he is talking uh, and, and he's talking and he's using uh, the he and you language for God. But one of the most powerful things that I noticed when, when I was reading this and as I began studying this is uh, it is poetry. Right, And so there is kind of like a formula and there's a format to like the beginning and the end and, and there's ways in which they tie together and certain verses connect back to other verses. That's the way poetry works. And, and so like I, I think it's really interesting that, that in the first few verses, um, David is using he language, but it doesn't take him very long to go to you language when he's talking about God. So he begins by saying, he makes me, he restores me, he leads me. And then he goes to, you are with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. You prepare a table before me. And so there's this kind of like flow of how the psalm plays out that's just really beautiful. But I think it points to maybe a deeper thing as well that um, the more we the more we give ourselves to God. And the more our relationship with God grows, the more we stop talking um, about him and we start talking to him. Do you see that? That, that like the more we begin to just fall in love with God and who he is and we fall in love w- with, with Jesus, it, the more and more it goes from talking about him to talking to him. And that's what happens here. He starts by talking about God and the things that God does, and then he's moving to talking to God. And I think that's just something we should all strive for in our own personal relationship with God. But every part of this psalm all comes back to verse 1. Verse 1 is the key verse that holds it all together. The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. Right? That idea of the Lord being our shepherd, I shall not want. Can we all say that? Can, can we say that about God and us? Can we say that about God today, that he is our shepherd, and so we don't want anything else? And a lot of times when we think about the idea of even want, we think about the idea of our desires, that we shall not want, right? That we shall not want anything else. 
But I think the idea behind what actually, uh, that's why I, I really like the, actually the NIV translation, even though the, the, the version that I memorized and that I learned is, you know, the Lord is my shepherd, so I shall not want. I really like what the NIV does whenever they, they change that and they translated it, the Lord is my shepherd, and so I lack nothing. Because that's probably closer to reality, is that whenever the Lord is our shepherd, we can trust him that he is going to give us what we need or what he desires for us. Not that there won't be times where like we don't want for things that we want, right? <laughs> or where our desires just absolutely, you know, get thrown out the wayside. But there is a sense of the more closely we walk with God and the more he becomes our shepherd, the less that our desires and our wants are what we, what we are really you know, bent on and our desires begin to conform to his desires. Our wants begin to conform to his wants for us. We begin to say, well, I lack nothing because God has given me what I need and what he desires for me to have. And so we begin to move in this, in this beautiful, beautiful relationship. You know, um, David in verse one, he says, the Lord is my shepherd. Um, David is a shepherd. He knows the ramifications of that. He knows how important that is. Uh, and a lot of times we think of sheep, or I've heard many times, I've heard many times in church, uh, pastors say, you guys know sheep are dumb, right? Right? You guys, you guys heard this? You've heard this thought and this idea that sheep are dumb? And, um, and that might be somewhat true. Um, <laughs> but, there, but they are also, there, there is something special about sheep that makes them uh, unique, a very unique animal, and not just aimless and dumb. One of the unique things about sheep is that they have a tremendous memory an ability to recognize and continue to recognize the same thing over and over again. And that's why Jesus in John chapter 10, verse 4, when he's talking about himself as the good shepherd, says that my sheep know my voice. And they, they hear it. And they follow it. Sheep, they know their shepherd. They recognize their shepherd when he speaks to them. And so this is a powerful, powerful idea that, that David is bringing out. And he's saying, I fully know my shepherd. I submit to my shepherd because he has always been there with me. And what really comes out of this psalm is that this psalm resembles a person whose heart is fully given over to God in trust. That I truly, I fully trust God with my life. That's what this psalm really draws out. I love what Brennan Manning says in his book, Ruthless Trust, about the idea of trust. He says, how do we hasten the advent or coming of the kingdom of God? Jesus, he says, proposes one single way. It's the way of trust. That for us to bring the kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven, we must learn how to trust God and trust Jesus and trust our shepherd. In his book, Opening to God, David Benner says, the opposite of faith is mistrust, not unbelief. I love that idea that the opposite of faith is actually mistrust, not unbelief. Like, we lack faith every time we put our trust or our hope or some, in something other than God. We, we can believe and show no faith. And so he says that, that faith, or the opposite of faith, is mistrust, not unbelief. Faith is trust in God's goodness. This is alone what makes it possible for us to approach God with openness. When we trust God, we will approach him with openness, with vulnerability, kind of like what we talked about last week. Maybe some of the reasons why it makes it hard for us to even lament or go through struggle 
and be honest about that is because we honestly don't trust that God is safe and he's a safe place to go with these things. So what I want to do is I want to, I want to unpack the rest of this psalm and kind of say, well, what is, what is David saying we can trust God for? And what can we trust God in? Because I think that's really what that's, this, this psalm is about. And so he makes us lie down in green pastures. He makes us lie down in green pastures. I love the idea that we must trust God to give us rest. We have to trust God to give us rest. Now, this is why I think Sabbath is so important. I talk about Sabbath a lot, but I think Sabbath and taking a day of rest is vital uh, in your relationship with God. Because most of us, uh, if you don't know the story, uh, most of us would rather live enslaved um, as opposed to living free. So the, the, uh, the, the Hebrews were in captivity in Egypt for 400 years. God frees them uh, through uh, just amazing, miraculous signs and wonders through the word of Moses, leads them out into the wilderness and gives them this covenant and begins to form this covenant with the Ten Commandments. And one of the Ten Commandments is keep the Sabbath day holy. Now, uh, it's, it's interesting because in, in the Exodus account of the, the command to keep the Sabbath holy, um, it says because God created the world in seven days and he rested on the seventh day, and so you should follow the rhythm of God and his rest. Um, that, that's, that's what it says in the Exodus account. But then there's a Deuteronomy account of the, 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 the Ten Commandments. And in the Deuteronomy account, the reason for keeping Sabbath is different. The reason for keeping Sabbath is, is that you were once slaves in Egypt. And everything that you did and who you were was determined by how many bricks you produced for this tyrant king, Pharaoh. You don't serve that tyrant king anymore. And so now you get a day of rest because you serve a good God who loves you and who offers you an opportunity to rest. I think it's a beautiful, beautiful picture of, of like this idea of taking a day to say, you know what, I'm not going to be a slave to a world that never stops. I do it all the time. My guess is you do it all the time. My encouragement to you would be to find a day to just stop and rest in the goodness of God. Don't give yourself to the tyranny of, of a culture that never stops and never sleeps. Don't become a slave when Christ loves you and died for you and set you free. And he offers you a chance to rest. Now, here's the thing about this, this rest. Rest is an expression of trust. Trust. When, when you take time to stop and you take time to rest, you have to believe that whatever needs to be taken care of, God's got it. Whatever is on your heart and whatever is on your mind and whatever you feel like needs to be done, you have to believe that whether it gets done or not, God's still in control. He's still sovereign. He's still ruling. He's still reigning. And so I love the fact that this is where David begins this psalm. He says, he makes you lie down in green pastures. He gives you this safe place where you can just take a rest because he loves you and because he's caring for you. Then it says, he leads me beside still waters. Now, when you look at the entirety of scripture, you see time and time again where there's this idea of chaos waters uh, where God takes something and he takes out of the chaos and he creates order and beauty and restoration. And what a, what a good shepherd would do is he would, he would lead his sheep along the riverbanks until there was a, a stillness in the stream. 
And then they would, he, would, he would take the sheep across the, the quiet waters or the still waters because the, the, the loud rushing water of white water would, would bring them anxiety and bring them angst. And so he was trying to offer them peace. He was trying to offer them this place where, where, the, where like they could cross and know like, hey, we're going to be okay. I love the idea that like Paul talks about in the New Testament, that when we pray, when we offer up our prayers and petitions, and we offer those things up to God, that he actually brings about a peace that surpasses all understanding. Like this is a place, like when you feel like, man, like I am just walking along and I, my life feels very chaotic and it's rushing like the waves, like stop. And begin to pray and begin to offer your prayers and petitions to God. And he will give you a peace that surpasses all understanding. He will take you and he'll begin to lead you through and by quiet waters and still waters. And he restores my soul. He offers us salvation. This idea of restoration um, is taking the places in us that are broken and remaking them and, re, uh, and making them new. You guys ever watch uh, home renovation shows? Yeah. They're like everywhere, right? Like, oh man. But they're so amazing. Like we get so mesmerized with them because of the transformation that takes place. And this is one of those parts of salvation and restoration that I think that most people miss. That salvation is, yes, Jesus saving us from our brokenness and from our sin and from our depravity, but in order to restore us and make us new, in order to transform us. Salvation is not a one-time event that happens when you pray a prayer or when you're dunked into water. Salvation is, is the, um, the act of walking with God and giving your life to him every day and him transforming you and restoring you and making you new in the deepest parts of your soul, in the deepest parts of who you are. Every day that we walk in the joy of our salvation is a day that he changes and transforms us in the deepest places of our of our life he leads me in paths of righteousness i i love um i love this word righteousness but i think it's often misunderstood um the idea of righteousness i think is oftentimes equated to um, the, and even associated with the word of holiness that if you're holy you're righteous or if you're righteous you're holy um, and um, I, think, I think the reality behind righteousness is that it's actually it's justice it's doing right by someone treating someone fairly that's righteousness and so he, he leads us in paths of righteousness. And, and I think one of the ways in which he does that, or the way in which I think primarily he will do that, is through his word. That when we give ourselves to his word, he begins to, he begins to teach us and he begins to show us what wisdom looks like. He begins to show us what it looks like to live rightly in relationship with him and with others. And so he leads us in paths of righteousness for his namesake. We should never forget that part of the psalm, that it's for his namesake. That he wants you living in right relationship with him and right relationship with others so that he might be glorified. So that people might see more of him in you and might give him praise. Not so people will think that you're awesome and that you're righteous and that you're holy. And then he 
he makes a shift in the psalm and says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Now, Pete Scazzaro, the writer of Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, calls this the dark night of the soul. That many of us will walk through and go through periods in time where we, we, we just, we go through this dark valley and we feel the shadow of death over us everywhere we go. And, and he says, but, but I don't fear in those moments. I trust that you are with me. He offers us his presence. He, he, he says, I'm, I'll be with you even in the darkest of valleys. You can trust that I'm not going anywhere and that if what the Bible says about Jesus is true, that he is the light and that the darkness cannot, will not, and has not overcome it, that he is going to reign brightly in the midst of the shadow of death. It says, your rod and your staff comfort me. This idea is where the sheep, they would go through the sheep pen at night uh, at the end of a long day of wandering through the wilderness and they would walk through bushes and thistles and thorns and all kinds of stuff would get torn up inside their wool. And so their wool would get all knotted and it would get all like tangled and mangled, all kinds of stuff, like just all over the place. And, and, so, uh, and so what the shepherd would do is take his staff as they came through the, the sheep pen or went into the sheep pen at the gate, he would lay his staff over the, that gate and they would walk underneath the staff and the staff would rip away all the iniquity and all of the pain and all of the struggle and all of the, the torment from the day. And so this is what it means that his rod and his staff, they comfort us, is that they're like, man, like we go through some stuff a lot of the time. This isn't that like, oh, you're going to have a nice, comfortable life. <laughs> that following Jesus is going to be super easy. You should sign up. <laughs> this is, no, 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 like you go through some stuff as you follow Jesus as you're with the shepherd. But he's always gonna be there at the end of every day to offer you comfort and help you deal with the pain and deal with the iniquity and deal with the struggle as you enter his gates. He says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He offers us provision and protection. I think, um, I, I used to always think of this as uh, provision solely, but then I paid closer attention to the second part of the verse that says that he, pro he provides for us in the presence of our enemy. So he's also there protecting us. I think it's, I, think he's, I don't know if Jesus had this in mind, although he is Jesus, and, uh, and so he might, um, but I love thinking about the fact that when Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross, he called his disciples to the table, and he broke his body by taking some bread and breaking it, and he held up a cup, and he said, this is my blood, which is poured out for you. And, um, and he invited his disciples to come back to the table again and again and again to remember this broken body and, and this shed blood. And I think, man, what a better, dis there is not a better display or a better table prepared for us in the presence of our enemy. An enemy who wants to, to ridicule us and keep us bent in our shame. An enemy that wants us to keep thinking about our sin and our struggle and, and, and think about how big of a wretch we are and how depraved we are as human beings. Like he would love to just let us continue to believe all of those things and live with that identity. And then Jesus prepares a meal for us to come back to again and again and again to remember that the enemy gets no seat at this table. 
that because of my broken body and because of my shed blood, you are, you are free. You are safe. You are protected. And I'm providing a way for you when otherwise there would be no way. He is our provision and our protection. He says, you anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. This idea of oil in all throughout the Bible is a symbol of God's spirit. And this is why James says in, in James, he says, if any of you are sick, Call the elders and have them anoint your head with oil and pray for you, for the prayers of uh, righteous people are powerful and effective. The idea of anointing somebody with oil is you're anointing them with the Spirit of God, because the Spirit that works the healing, not the person, right? And, and so the idea is in this is that like He's giving us His Spirit. And you've anointed me with your Spirit. Now this is, the oil was what kept, kept the flames burning. It's what kept the lamps going. And so this oil is a symbol of the spirit that is upon you and upon me if we are Christians, if we are followers of Jesus. We have been anointed with the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, now lives in you. And so no matter what we face, we have a joy that just never runs dry. Our cup continues to overflow again and again and again because we have the joy of salvation. Not because, again, life is easy and we're happy all the time. But because we know that my hope is in Christ and Christ alone. And I have a joy of salvation every single day. I'm full of this joy that he gives me that is greater than my circumstance. It says, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Surely goodness and mercy. I think of forgiveness. That we trust God for forgiveness in his goodness. That he is so good to us that we don't deserve it. But in his goodness, he loves us and he comes and he dies on the cross for our sins. His goodness and his mercy. Instead of giving us what we deserve, he, he doesn't. Instead, he gives us something we don't deserve, which is his grace. And he says, you're forgiven. And that forgiveness follows us. It goes with us everywhere we go. We hold tightly to it each day. Because it's our only hope. And then I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He's, we have to trust him with eternity. And that he's given us eternity. Right now and in the future. That because we are in Christ, like he's made a way for us to experience and have a relationship with him right now and forevermore. And we don't have to wait until we die to experience a life spent in the internal union with God. But that we can have the eternal union with God right here, right now as we live and breathe and walk on this earth because of Jesus and because of his love for us. Because he is a good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. He gives us eternity. I love this psalm. It's so beautiful. The things that we can trust God for. But we have to trust him. He must be our shepherd. If we are ever to be able to proclaim that, man, I lack none of these good things that he has for me. That I'm able to take hold of the rest and the peace. I'm able to take hold of the salvation and the righteous wisdom that comes by walking with him and being in his presence. 
I'm able to experience the comfort after long days. I've seen him provide and protect me. I've seen his spirit work in me. I trust that I'm forgiven and that I'm free and that follows me all the days of my life all the way into eternity where I'm in union with him forevermore I hope um, I hope today um, maybe something in that encourages you to not just think about this as a psalm that we read at a funeral but a psalm that we say again and again and again as we rise and as we walk uh, one of uh, one of my uh, favorite authors uh, as I was reading said that he had put into practice this idea of as soon as he woke up every morning he recited the 23rd psalm before he pulled his feet out of bed and let him hit the floor that the 23rd psalm was the thing that he recited every single morning uh, because I do think it is a psalm to carry with us each and every day of our life as people who have a relationship with this God who loves us and who offers us uh, a relationship with him and, uh, and so I started doing the same thing uh, just because I thought you know what I need a practice like that and so I started doing the same thing and there have been times where I've gotten away from it uh, but man I tell you what like my days go so much better when I don't forget my days go so much better when I don't just reach for my phone as soon as the alarm goes off and start looking at whatever. My days go so much better when my eyes open and I begin to say, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters and he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When I start my day like that, it's really hard for my day to go bad from there. And so I want to be able to, to, to help you do the same thing. So because many of us know a lot of the 23rd Psalm, instead of learning one verse of a psalm this week, last week we learned Psalm 88.1. I don't know if anybody else can still recite it, right? Lord, you are the God who saves me. Day and night I cry out to you. Anybody else remember that? Hopefully you do. Today we're going to memorize all of Psalm 23. All right, so we're going to read it. Now, I will say um, the way I read it earlier over you uh, is a little different than the way it's written on this. The way it's written on here is the way that I've memorized it and uh, I think probably the way most of us remember hearing it, okay? Uh, so that's why I chose this because I think it'll be easier for us to grab a hold of and memorize. So let's, let's go after memorizing this together. Let's read it together, okay? Let's start. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. All right, let's take away some of the words. Here we go. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He 
he he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake even though i walk through the valley of the shadow of death i will fear no evil for you are with me your rod and your staff they comfort me you prepare a table for me for me in the presence of my enemies you All right, let's take it all away. All right, I'm going to say the Lord is my shepherd. You guys are going to finish it. Can you do it? All right, here we go. The Lord is my shepherd. Righteousness. No, I walk through the valley. All right, hold on one second. Let's go from even though, okay? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. You prepare, you anoint, surely. Good job, y'all. You give yourself a round of applause. All right. So I know some of you think, man, I cannot memorize scripture. I just can't remember these things. I'll try things like that. Read it a couple times. Start taking some words away. And then take it all away. Right? Very quickly, you will begin to retain a lot of chunks of scripture. There's a reason why... Uh, the Pharisees were able to memorize the first five books of the Old Testament. Your brain can do it. God created it so that it could, so that you could take it with you and carry it with you every single day as you walk along the road with him, that you never forget his word and you hold on to it very near and dear to your heart. I hope and pray you will carry Psalm 23 very close as, uh, as you walk through your days. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you just for the chance to be in your word. And God, we thank you for the promises that are there. Uh, God, I thank you for calling us into deeper places of trust with you, that we can trust you, that we uh, can know you um, by, by just allowing you to give us rest and peace allowing you to show us your righteousness and taking hold of your comfort God that we just rest in your presence knowing that you are always near even in the darkest times God, that you are always providing and protecting as our enemy tries to invade and speak lies to us, that you and your word and your body and your blood are a truth to hold on to, to keep our enemy at bay, that we are forgiven, that we are free, and that we can have a relationship with you now and forevermore. God, I pray that you will just instill us with this hope, a desire to be with you and let you be our shepherd, to be your sheep, to know your voice when you call, 
a desire to walk in your ways and um, be transformed by by your restoring power. God, we love you. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.